Hello, my name is Jason Kendall. I'm going to be taking you through a series of lectures based on introductory astronomy. So we're going to begin at the very beginning with a lot of really interesting things. First, what is astronomy? Astronomy is really the study of the skies. It began a very, very long time ago, over 6,000 years ago, and has been part of human existence for as long as anyone can remember. And, is, and in fact, most of early cultures have a lot to do with their astronomical inf information. Well, so our place in space is one way we talk about it. In a very modern sense, we've been talking about lots of things and inside of science fiction and, and very common science knowledge, people really want to know where we are in space. Well, there's some really basic, basic, basic terms that are elementary to astronomy. And the first one is a planet. A planet is a thing that orbits a star. More specifically, a planet used to be the name of a wandering star, which we'll get to in later lectures. But a planet these days is just something that where you could theoretically have Kirk and Spock beam down to the surface and then walk around and do stuff. Or a planet could be something that's a huge gas giant that nothing can land upon. The next bigger objects in the cosmos are stars, and stars are things that shine by their own light. They have nuclear fusion going on in the cores, they are much more massive than planets, much bigger. In fact, stars tend to be hundreds of thousands of times, tens of thousands of times mass, more massive than planets, and they actually live for much longer periods of time, and they're the center of various solar systems. In all cases, all planets orbit a star. Now, there can be rogue planets that, for some bizarre reason, are flung out, but in general, planets orbit stars, and that's one of the definitions. Okay, so stars then come in great huge groups. Hundreds of billions of stars can all group together and be part of what we would call a galaxy. Our Milky Way is such a galaxy, the Andromeda Nebula is such a galaxy, M101 and M31 and M74 are such kinds of galaxies, and these are wonderful objects to go out and see. They're very, very distant, and the spaces between them are enormous. The sizes of galaxies tend to be about hundreds of thousands of light years across and they're separated by such distances as well. Now, bigger than that is the construction of hundreds of billions of galaxies. And the hundreds of billions of galaxies that are, that are out there, we would call that our observable universe. And when we get to later chats, we'll learn that the observable universe is a thing that which we can see. So there could be more stuff that we can't see, but more importantly, the observable universe is that which we can see. So the observable universe is composed of galaxies, when galaxies are composed of stars, and stars have planets orbiting them, and creatures like us live on planets. And stars are very, very far apart, separated by trillions and trillions of miles, which we tend to measure in light years, or parsecs, as a distance measurement. So astronomy is the subject matter that covers all these types of objects and tries to define how they're born, how they live, how they die, uh, what they do when they're, when they're living, how they actually come to be, and what processes by which they act. Astronomy is not astrology. Astrology is looking at the stars and trying to decide whether or not your future shall be bright or dim. Um, basically, astronomy is a science and astrology is a pseudoscience. So we can kind of dismiss with that immediately. Well, one of the first things that we want to do when we study astronomy is we go outside and we look up. And when we look up on a very, very dark, clear sky, somewhere way deep somewhere, maybe you're on the tops of the, of the islands of Mauna Kea, maybe you're out in the desert, maybe you're in a city, or maybe you have the opportunity to go to someplace dark, like uh, Cherry Springs State Park, which is in northwestern Pennsylvania, a gorgeous place to go stargazing. And you, when you look up, you see a dark sky and you see stars. You'll notice that stars come in these patterns that you'll see year after year after year at the same time of year. And in the patterns of the stars, we can link them together with little lines that we pretend that they're there. We can group them together, make pictures out of these dots, and then we can call them constellations. A constellation is an apparent grouping of stars in the sky. They don't necessarily have to have any relationship to each other. They, the stars don't, but they just are in the same direction of the sky. And when we look at constellations, there's some familiar ones that we know of, uh, such as Orion with the three belt stars and the four around it. And then you have the Big Dipper, which is part of the large constellation Ursa Major, the Big Bear. 
Well, if we look, how many stars can we see? If we look up in the sky on all these pictures of constellations, typically if we were in a purely dark location and we have a massive power outage and there's no lights in the sky anywhere, you'll find that there's roughly about 6,000 stars in the entire sky that you can see without the aid of a telescope. That's a lot of stars. And if you go to someplace really dark, you start to lose track very quickly of how many stars you count. In an urban environment, you might be lucky to count 100 stars. In a very dense urban and light polluted environment, you might get five or six. So light pollution has taken away our ability to see many of the stars and actually identify the constellations. Up until the 1950s and 60s, um, basically the constellations were there for everyone to see. But as modern society has become more illuminated in terms of street lighting and outdoor lighting that never gets turned off, we start to lose that light because the light gets reflected to the ground, to the sky, and causes sky glow. And so sky glows prevent us from seeing constellations. However, if you're part of a class, get outside of town, go someplace dark, and see the stars, and try to see if you can pick out those constellations. So some prominent constellations are those that we call the zodiac. The zodiac are 12, or if you wish, 13 constellations through which the sun appears to move throughout a year. So we can try to find our way around the sky, and there's many ways to do so. Uh, one way that we can find our way around the sky is simply look for these constellations, these agreed upon pictures in the sky, like such as Orion. Orion, the brightest star in Orion, we would call that Alpha. The second brightest star is Beta. So the brightest star in Orion, its name is Betelgeuse, and we have add the Greek letter Alpha to give it to say that it is the brightest, and Rigel is the second brightest in that constellation, and so we designate it with the Greek letter beta. So that's pretty much what you see from many, many, many stars and constellations. There's a couple that are a little weird, but in general, the brightest star is alpha, the second brightest is beta, the third brightest is gamma, and so on. And then the brightnesses go to numbers after you run out of Greek letters. So when we look up at this, that's one way of kind of navigating our way around. But you have to know the constellations, and that's a big problem because not everybody does, and not everybody has a laser pointer, and maybe they're too difficult to find. So we have a new definition for constellations. Constellations are a region of, of sky that's uh, delineated by common, uh, by, by common agreement. And the common agreement is with the International Astronomical Union. So what are those things that are in the sky that we call constellations, and how do we get to agree where they are? Well, we've actually created a coordinate system. Just like there's latitude and longitude on the Earth to help us find places, and latitude and longitude are frequently used by map makers and governments to actually delineate the boundaries of their locations on the surface of the Earth. So if we take this natural thing, the latitude and longitude of the Earth, and we extend it out into space, and we pretend that it is on the sky, we think then, therefore, that the sky looks like a big dome. It looks like if you're in some place extremely dark, it looks like an enormous dome is over you. And we call that dome the celestial sphere. It's an imaginary dome. There is no celestial sphere, but it looks like one to us. So since it looks like one to us, we can pretend that it has a coordinate system on top of it. So there are two basic elements to this coordinate system that I'm going to call the equatorial coordinate system. They're called right ascension and declination. So right ascension is a, the effective, the, the nature of, sorry, it's like latitude. I'm sorry, it's like longitude. So right ascension is like longitude on the sky and declination is like latitude. So the Earth's equator set out into space. If you were on the Earth's equator and looked straight up, you would be looking at the celestial equator. And the celestial equator is declination zero. And if you went 90 degrees up, from the declin of declination, you would be at the north celestial pole, and that's, that's where you would be if you're, if you're at the north pole of the Earth and look straight up, you'd see the north celestial pole. And if you went south 90 degrees from de in declination from the celestial equator, you would be at the south celestial pole. So, each, uh, so declination is just like latitude, but it's projected on the sky. So that's pretty easy to see. So there's poles to it, and there's an equator to it, just like that. So with latitude, I mean with longitude, it's a little different. The longitudinal idea is called right ascension. And unfortunately, it's not measured in degrees, it's measured in hours. And hours are 15 degree units. 
So you get 365 divided by 24 is 15, so you get these 15 degree increments. And the reason for that is that the sun goes around the earth every 24 hours, so it seems to actually move about one hour of right ascension every hour. And that's what it looks like it does. So what we have is that if you want to see when a star is going to rise, you look at its right ascension, and that tells you the time with respect to the sun. So you, if you know where the sun's right ascension is, you know where the star's right ascension is, you can determine the time just by looking at their coordinates. So right ascension can have any zero point, just like longi uh, lat longitude can have any zero point. There's no real zero point to it. So we choose a point on the celestial sphere where the zodiac intersects the celestial equator. And that point is called the vernal equinox. And that's the place in the sky where the sun lives at roughly the end, uh, like March 20th or 21st or 22nd. So on those days, the sun is on the celestial equator. It is rising above the celestial equator as it marches its way around the sky and we get the sun as, as it's our designated point. And it's called the vernal equinox because that's when the sun is right on the celestial equator. And that's where we define the zero point for right ascension. And it goes eastward from there. In any event, uh, these, this is one coordinate system and that's tied to the stars because if you look out into space, the celestial co or the coordinate system stays fixed with respect to the stars just like latitude and longitude stay fixed with respect to the Earth. Now there is a different coordinate system that's much more helpful to us if we're just going stargazing in our backyard. It's called the altitude azimuth coordinate system. If you face due north, that has an azimuth angle of zero, and if you go to the east, it'll be 90 degrees is east, 180 degrees is south, 270 degrees is west, and back to 360 degrees is north. So it's like, think of the, uh, that you're, look, you're measuring an angle around the horizon. So then you have another angle, which is elevation or altitude. So altitude is, if it's on the horizon, it's at zero, and 90 degrees up, it's at the zenith or at the top of the sky. Now stars move through this coordinate system. So the altitude and azimuth coordinate system is with respect to the observer, not with respect to the stars. So there are two different coordinate systems. And the altitude and azimuth is good if you want to say, hey, this is about 30 degrees up from the horizon due east. It's like, okay. But that doesn't help you if you're trying to tell somebody where something is and they, you live in New York and they live in Montana. So if you're, trying, you're on the phone with somebody in Montana trying to tell them where this really cool comet is in the sky, you can't use altitude and azimuth. You must use the equatorial coordinate system and show them where it is in right ascension and declination. So there's some basic things. Astronomy is the study of the things in the sky. We're going to be studying planets, stars, galaxies, and the universe. And our first step is looking at the sky. We see constellations, which are groups of stars in the sky. They're, or they've, they're given proper names, such as Betelgeuse, and Bellatrix, and Rigel, and Polaris, which is the North Star, and all sorts of other names. And they have proper names, as well as designated names, like, like the Alpha Orionis, or Beta Orionis, or Alpha Alpha Ursa Major or Beta Ursa Major, where the Greek letter is determined their brightness and the, always the first letter in the Greek alphabet is the brightest one. Also, we then have coordinate systems to help us find things. And this is important because you look up in the sky and you always want to tell somebody, hey, look, I saw this really cool thing up in the sky. This is where it is. And so you tell them using coordinates. If they're standing right next to you, you can use the altitude and azimuth coordinate system. If they're on the phone or the internet with somebody far, far, far away, and they might not, if the thing hasn't even risen yet, but you want to see it after you've had sunset or you had sunrise and it's time for them to have sunset, then you would explain it to them using the right ascension and declination coordinate system called equatorial. So that's our beginning, and we're going to do more soon. See you soon.